I'm going to show you how to install Betaflight onto your board. And I don't mean just flashing Betaflight onto a board because that's not too hard. And I actually have a video about that. What I'm going to show you is the whole process of installing and setting up the drivers, which I think is a place where a lot of people go wrong. If you've ever been in a scenario where you couldn't get the board to connect and you couldn't get it to flash and you're trying to put it in bootloader mode and yada, 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 and it's just not working, chances are one of these things has gone wrong. I'm going to show you how to fix it. So the first thing I want to tell you is that these boards cannot be bricked per se by anything you do while you're flashing them. The piece of code that is used to copy the firmware onto the board is called the bootloader. The bootloader for the chips that we use is in read-only memory, which means it cannot be overwritten. And that means that you can't brick it by messing up your flash. You should always be able to put the board into bootloader or DFU mode, same thing, different name, by pushing the button or by shorting the pads or whatever you do on your board or on Betaflight 3.0, you can just type the DFU command into the CLI. Oh, yeah. You should always be able to put the board into bootloader mode and flash new code to it unless you physically damage the board in some way. So you could, you, could, you could lift a pad or you could damage a chip on the board and then the board is, what's well, damaged, it's not bricked per se, it's just damaged. But in general, unless the board is physically damaged in some way, you should be able to recover it. If you can't get to the board, probably your drivers are messed up. So let's start by talking about what, how to get your drivers working correctly. The first thing you need to do is you need to install the CP210 drivers, which are downloaded from here. And you can download these drivers for your operating system of choice. So we're going to download VCP right here. You do not need to download VCP with serial enumeration. You don't want that. Download VCP and install. So we've got the zip file here. We're going to extract all of that. We're going to run the installer. You're going to run the x86 installer if you have 32-bit environment. Or I think the x64 installer is for a 64-bit environment. But actually, I think I've always just installed the 32-bit drivers. I'm not sure. Try one, and if it doesn't work, try the other. <laughs> That's the gist of it. Go ahead and run the installer and install the drivers, and you should be good to go there. The next thing you need to do is download the VCP drivers. I thought we just did download the VCP drivers. I know that's confusing. It says download VCP, but those aren't actually the VCP drivers. These are the VCP drivers. These were the STM32 drivers. Okay, fine. So there's two sets of drivers you need to download. Just go with it. For this one, you actually have to do this annoying process where you accept the license agreement. And then you have to fill in your first name, your last name, your email address. They email you a link to download it. Ugh. But it's not too bad. Do that and install that. So I've been waiting for about three minutes for this validation email to come, the download email. It hasn't come yet. I'm going to move on with the video. What I need to tell you about this one is, though, when you download the VCP driver, you get an .exe file. The .exe file is not actually the driver installer. It's a self-extracting archive. And what that means is when you run the exe file that you download, you haven't installed the driver. You've just unpacked the archive onto your desktop. And so a lot of people think they've installed the driver and they haven't. You need to run the exe file that you download, which will unpack the, the archive onto your desktop. And then you go into the folder that got extracted. And from there, you run the actual driver installer. OK, so now you have installed the CP210 drivers and the STM, uh, the VCP drivers. So the next thing you're going to do is you're going to plug in the card after you've installed the drivers. OK, and we should see the, the card is powered up now. That's normal. We should see the drivers uh, get installed. And you can see here we've got COM13 up here. So we have a new COM port up here. And that's telling us that the, the card has been recognized. Now, I don't know what COM5 is on here. Normally, what you just see is manual selection when the card is not plugged in, and you see COM13 or COM whatever, some number, when the card is plugged in. I want you to notice the LEDs here and what they're doing. We have a solid blue LED and a blinking green LED. Now, on some boards, those are blue and red. They're not always the same color, but the blinking LED is telling you that the board is in sort of flight controller mode. It's, it's acting as a flight controller. The blue LED is telling you that the status is fine. If you watch what this does, when I first power it up, it will flash quickly. And that's the, you know, when you power it up and the buzzer goes beep, 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 beep. And then it will flash three times, one, two, three. 
and that's the gyro calibrating. Watch it carefully. Yep. There's the gyro calibration. Okay, so, so that's the indication that the board is operating normally as a flight controller. Now I want to go to the ports tab next, and I want to show you what we see in the ports tab. Notice that in the ports tab I have USB VCP. Now there's two ways these boards can be connected to your computer. One is via uh, the virtual COM port or VCP. And what that means is that this microprocessor here itself is handling the USB connection. It's doing the USB enumeration and all the other things that a USB device has to do. I don't know what they are. The other way this can work is that you can have a thing called a CP210 chip on the board. It is a physical chip that you'll find on the board. And in that case, the CP210 chip handles the USB protocol. And the flight controller, the microprocessor, has no idea that it's talking over USB. It just is sending serial ones and zeros out a UART. So if you see USB VCP here, you have virtual COM port. If you do not see USB VCP here, you have a CP210 chip. And the reason that matters is because if you have a virtual COM port, there's another step you need to do. You need to do the Zadig thing. Now, what's the Zadig thing? In order to flash the board, the board needs to be in bootloader or DFU mode. And when it goes into DFU mode, if you have a virtual COM port, the Windows drivers don't work. You need to download a different device driver in order to flash a VCP board under Windows. And you do that using Zadig. So I'm going to download Zadig next. And Zadig is just a tool that lets you install the driver. And there it is. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to click Options, List All Devices, and I'm going to find my flight controller. Now here is the first mistake that many people make. Don't do this. You see how it says STM32 Virtual COM Port here? That indicates that the board is not in bootloader mode. You do not want to overwrite this with Zadig. You see how right now we've got the WinUSB, we've got the USB SARA driver, whatever that is, and we could click this button, replace driver, and we could overwrite it with the WinUSB. Do not do that. You do not want to replace the STM32 VCP virtual COM port driver with the Zadig driver. If you do that, you have to uninstall the driver, you have to reboot your machine, and you have to reinstall the driver from scratch. What I'm going to do is I'm going to unplug the board. Now this device should go away, and it did. I'm going to hold down the bootloader button, and I'm going to plug the board in again. Now you'll notice that the lights didn't flash. We've just got one solid blue LED, and that tells us that we're in bootloader mode or DFU mode. If I go to the configurator, I do not see COM13 or whatever it was anymore, but I also don't see DFU. If you have a VCP board and you plug the chip in in bootloader mode, you will see DFU up here in the pull-down menu. If you have a CP210 board, you will not see DFU up here. And the reason is that the CP210 chip is hiding whether the, chip, whether the flight controller is in bootloader mode or not from the computer. So since we have a VCP board, we should see DFU up here when we're in bootloader mode, but we don't. But the blue LED, the solid blue LED, is telling us that we're in bootloader mode. So what's going on there? What's going on is that the driver isn't installed correctly. Now that I'm in bootloader mode, I can click on this menu and I see STM32 bootloader. That is the one that you want to do replace driver to install the WinUSB driver. Now at this point, you may need to reboot your computer for this to work. You may not. Let's find out. Let's do that. Let's close that and let's and let's reconnect this it's in bootloader mode. So solid blue LED tells me I'm in bootloader mode. When I start the configurator, look here, DFU. So now I'm in bootloader mode. The configurator agrees I'm in bootloader mode and now I can flash the board. So let's break down the troubleshooting process. If you want to flash the board, you need to be in bootloader mode. You know you're in bootloader mode when there is a solid blue LED on the board. That's the most reliable indicator and no other LED. If you have a board with a virtual COM port, you will also know you're in bootloader mode when you see DFU up here in the configurator. 
if you have a board with a CP210 chip and no virtual COM port, you will not see DFU up here. You will always just see COM13. And you won't be able to tell from that whether you're in bootloader mode. But again, you can refer back to the LED on the board. If the board is in bootloader mode and you know you have a VCP board and you still don't see DFU up here, it's probably because your drivers aren't installed correctly. You need to download Zadig. You need to find the STM32 bootloader device, not the STM32 virtual COM port device. And you need to replace the STM32 bootloader device with the Zadig driver. If your board has a CP210 chip and not a VCP, then you do not need to do the Zadig thing. You can simply install the CP210 driver, and then you put your board in bootloader mode, and away you go. If at any point things aren't working right, you may have screwed up your drivers. For example, in Zadig, you may have accidentally overwritten the STM32 virtual COM port device instead of the bootloader device. What you can do is you can go find the device. So you're going to need to plug in in bootloader mode. You're going to right click uninstall. And then you'll see if I disconnect. Now the bootloader device goes away. And if I just plug in in regular mode, not bootloader mode, now I've got this additional COM port. Did you see that COM13 just appeared? So if I really wanted to clean house, I would uninstall COM13. And then I would plug the device in in bootloader mode. I would go down to USB devices and I would uninstall the STM32 bootloader device. I would then reboot the computer, I would reinstall the drivers, I would redo the Zadig just for the bootloader device, and I should be good to go. I know there's been a lot of detail in this video. I hope that it's been really educational for you. A lot of people don't understand the driver architecture that's used with Betaflight and CleanFlight and the difference between the, uh, the, the STM32 virtual COM port driver and the STM32 bootloader driver or why sometimes you see DFU in the upper right and sometimes you don't. Uh, I hope this has all made sense. I hope it's been helpful and I hope the next time you're pulling your hair out because your board won't flash that the steps in this video will help you make it right. Thanks for watching. Happy flying.